TLO, what's poppin'? We are on Twitch. We are not live. But you can leave a like, comment, subscribe, turn on your post notification bells. Man, let's continue to grow the family from Chicago to the UK. And if we ever are live and you miss one, this is, the, this is where you go to see anything, man. Keep in mind, if anybody out there who's willing to do shorts or knows how to do shorts, come on, man. Come on over here. You can do shorts for this channel. I grant you access, but you got to show me something. Anywho, um, don't forget we do got the, uh, the uh, Discord. This is on and busting. I'm getting a lot of my reactions from off of here lately. Um, and then we got the Patreon. I appreciate for all the new subs and all the new followers and all the new members on the Patreon and the old ones who've been doing this. I appreciate that, man. The Patreon really helps me, you know, support. It really helps me, you know, do my day-to-day, -day, pay the bills. You know, I appreciate that, man. Um, HMP Full Sudden, Evil Behind Bars. Okay, okay. Shout out to the first responders, man. Appreciate y'all, man. Let's get into this, man. I think I've watched the full... I don't know if I've watched it. No, maybe not. I don't know. I didn't watch so many. We'll find if you're out. ever sentenced to life in prison... That's a crazy way to start a documentary. I ain't even gonna hold you. You could be sent to one of the most feared places you've never heard of. If you go there, society pretty much has whacked its hand off you. Hey. If you go there, society... He pretty much has whacked its hand off you. Salute. HMP Full Sutton. You're stuck in the middle of some of the most dangerous, violentest, and craziest criminals. I just watched the documentary. You don't know where you're going, but you'll join some of the worst inmates in British criminal history. The most serious people in the country who end up in prison end up there. You could be on a wing with one of the UK's worst ever serial killers. It was frightening. There is no doubt about that. You could even come face to face with a child rapist. He was relentless. Britain's worst paedophile. Doubtful. He's still alive in that one? It's a place where even guards aren't safe. I genuinely feared for my life. I didn't think I was coming out of there. I'm just stopped. Stored. Let's get to it. I hate doing that to, to, to free things. Home to nearly 600 convicted criminals, this is HMP Full Sutton, a prison built to house Britain's most dangerous men. HMP Full Sutton is a high security prison purpose built in 1987. It was created for the most dangerous and difficult category A and category B prisoners. People who presented a real risk to the community were they to be let out. In 1965, two of the great train robbers had escaped from prison. As a result of Victorian prisons such as Wakefield, Wormwood Scrubs, Hull and Parkhurst, uh, which were uh, effectively turned in to category A prisons. But one of the problems with that, of course, was that security had to be hung on old structures that were not built for that particular purpose. As a result, they built some new prisons and Full Sutton was one of those prisons. Full Sutton was to contain the worst criminals in Britain and so it needed to be constructed with a formidable design. This would be a massively secure prison. They had four units that were built when the prison was first opened and known as uh, courtyard design. It was designed not like a Victorian prison, which usually had a central hub and then straight wings off it. Full Sutton, by contrast, was designed in a slightly different way, which meant it was made it's in square. quadrangles. Basically, oh, they were on a square. There was no windows, cells either side, and a, an exercise yard in the middle. 
and there were walls round them on all sides. They would also then have the prison walls and the other barriers that would prevent escape. Prisoners, they're going to find it very intimidating. It's never had an escape. I like these. It keeps adjusting these, man. Okay. Which is remarkable. It's a secure regime. Sentenced to life here, you'll have been convicted of the most heinous of crimes. Killers, serial rapists, child molesters. If you like, Full Sutton has the worst of the worst. Full Sutton has been home to some of Britain's most notorious criminals. Inmates who've been locked up here include... Dennis Nielsen is among Britain's most famous serial killers. Dale Cregan, the Manchester gangster who killed two uniformed police women. Dale Crager, hold on man, y'all know I gotta get my little notes out, man, for this one. You know, I gotta add on to what we've been. Okay, hold on now, rewind it. The Manchester gangster. Dale Cregan, the Manchester gangster who killed two uniformed police women. David Mulcahy, the so-called railway rapist who became a serial killer. Railway... The media just be giving them names, huh? Daniel Restivo, hair fetishist who brutally killed a lady in Bournemouth. Let's leave that open. So they'd arrive normally by sweatbox bus, which brings them in. If you're a Category A inmate entering Full Sutton, you'll arrive at the prison under the highest level of security. We get to the main gates of the prison, which are electronic, they move to the side, we move in. Then somebody comes out of the office with like a stick and a big mirror on it. Somebody comes... Sarah Jane Baker. Okay, all right. Out uh, of the office with like a stick and a big mirror on it so they can look underneath the van to make sure nothing's being brought in. Shout out to the community. Yeah. They get taken in through to reception where they get booked in, they get searched. You'll go through the process of being strip searched. You put a set of clothing on, get your bags. When they go through, they'll have these machines with all your toiletries, your food. This dude has been in every prison. Yam your yammy. clothes just to see if it picks up any metals Career or criminal. any hidden phones and that kind of stuff. And then they'll be taken by the reception staff through to the, whatever wing they're going to be living on. On the walk to your wing, Full Sutton's austere design will give an unsettling sense of what it feels like to be an inmate at this prison. You have to go through a lot of security between sort of 10 and 15 doors and gates from the entrance to where your wing is. As soon as we went inside the building, it very quickly became disorientating. I had no idea what floor I was on, which way I was pointing, north, south, east, west. I bet you there's a purpose for that, you know. There's obviously a purpose for that. When I used to live in Chicago, um, and I would bring anybody to my house or go, or, or when I was going home, I would never take the same way, and sometimes I would just zigzag through streets. So if nobody could remember where I lived exactly, nobody could, nobody could follow me home. It's a purpose to that. Uh, I had no clue. It's eerie. People be like, where are we? you are like, hey, the crew, we, we made it. <laughs> and claustrophobic and quite depressing. It smells strange as well. Even the prison officer who was taking me to the wing said the same thing. He said, can you smell the place? And I could. And he said, you just get used to it. I didn't get used to it in the whole time that I was there. This is a stench and a smell that makes your stomach turn. I don't know if it's just me, but I think there's many men who will tell you the same thing. It's like it sucks you in. 
It feels like you've been sucked into a void. Your legs feel wobbly. Doom's the best way I can describe it. Walking onto a wing can be pretty daunting. You'll be looking up, you'll be looking down, who's there, who's there. If you don't know your way around, if it's all new, you don't know who's going to be there. You want to meet old friends because you want to feel safe in this new environment because it is frightening. There is no doubt about that. On your first day on the square wings of Full Sutton, you'll soon realise that its unusual layout poses some serious problems. The courtyard design has design faults, such as inaccessible areas or areas where people can escape surveillance. You've got all these little corridors, all these little stairways. I didn't know where I was. There's no natural light or anything like that. And the way they're laid out to walk landing to landing, you have to go round blind corners. There was no windows, there was nothing. Once you were in there, you could have been beaten to death and nobody would have known. People would ambush you. People would just hold you up and rob you. Do you know what? Oh, you what? can have weeks and stuff where it's just chilled out. It's, it's not... Shane Taylor, man, we just did the pod. I just seen your podcast. I mean, I just reacted to the podcast with all your stories. It's a crazy dude that found God. Salute, though. Never too late to change. Nothing really happens, and then you can have months where it's just constant. There's been times when people have had hits put on them and they've not even known who did the hit. Because someone's just put their arm around the corner and threw the water in their face and just vanished. There are places that you could hide, not like a Victorian prison, which usually has straight wings, which made it easier for the prison officers to see a wing. It's interesting that the old Victorian designers probably had a better idea of how to control desperate men than someone in 1987 designing a new maximum security prison. Next, Britain's Makes most sense. violent inmates turn their anger towards the staff. I genuinely feared for my life. I didn't think I was coming out of there. HMP Full Sutton is a top security prison in East Yorkshire. And on your first day here, you'll have to quickly adapt to its strict routine. Daily life at Full Sutton is very routine based. Uh, around seven in the morning, um, there's an unlock, so everybody is let out. They can get their hot water, they can empty their bins, they can get a shower, do all of their sort of daily life essentials, basically. Then the majority of prisoners go to work. There's a labor board which, which tells you where you're employed and you got Landing one, landing two, landing three, the cell numbers, my name, your name, prison number, your place of work. At that time there was things like a, a braille sh workshop, a motorcycle repair workshop, painting and decorating, and then there were jobs. On a motorcycle repair workshop? Whose motorcycles are they repairing? Like who's, tr like members of the public or? Staff or what's, who's the motorcycles that are repair? The wings, cleaning the wing, keeping it tidy. It's actually similar to a normal society, really, other than you can't just wander off on your own. At 3 p.m., everyone will come back from workshops. They're normally allowed a few hours of sort of association time. During that time, they can play pool, they can interact with each other as much as they want. You can socialise, cook your food and go on the telephone, go to the gym or whatever. That's the highlight of their day. And then what happens at about seven o'clock is they all get locked up for the night. Uh, the night staff come in and then everyone is locked up until seven o'clock the next morning. I ain't gonna lie, that sounds like real life. We wake up at like seven in the morning, go to work, come home, chill, unwind, Go to the gym, eat, talk to the homies, get on the phone. And if you a certain age, hey, bedtime. <laughs> I'm going to my bedroom watching TV on y'all. So Despite being in prison, there is one kind of freedom the inmates at Full Sutton can experience. Okay. In Full Sutton, you're allowed to cook your own food. And some people are really good chefs and they can cook really, really good. So, like, you'll get some Jamaican guys can cook some serious food, some Asian brothers 
cook some serious food. Some people are living better in there with their food standards than out in society, yes. Because there's nothing else to do apart from to cook. And you can walk about the wing with a nine inch kitchen blade. Did you know that? In the top security prisons. You go in the office, sign out a nine inch kitchen blade. So you can imagine how paranoid everyone is. Knowing that you're in the top security prison, you walk about with big nine inch kitchen blades. They know not to use that knife to stab anyone because otherwise they're going to take it away from all of us. They'll go and get their own knife to stab someone if they want to stab someone. Some people are just sensible. No. That makes sense. That makes sense. You know what I'm saying? Don't put, don't put, don't put, don't put your little get backs or wars on the, on the, on the, on the bellies of other people that's hungry. You know what I'm saying? If we get these knives taken away, then what? Then that's really, you're going to get beat up probably if you get that knife taken away. You, you, you probably, whatever you got going on personally, if you use that knife, it's going to be worse for you probably. I've got the head screwed on. They know that if they go down that route, it's not going to be nice for them. They know if they go down that route, they're never going to get out. So they're sensible. They want to they use the head, get in, do your jail and get out of prison. That's sensible. But to make it through your first day, you'll still need to watch your back as a violent attack could be just around the corner. The stress level, it's just crazy. If you look at someone for too long, they'll start thinking, what are you staring at us for? You must be plotting something. Next thing you know, they're running in your cell and stabbing you up because you looked at them wrong. Everywhere that I went, I'd have at least two biro pens on me that I could use for weapons. The whole environment of it, you, you end up buying into it. Extreme violence can come out of nowhere. It could be anything. It could be spontaneous. It could be someone made a mistake and didn't say sorry. It can come from anywhere. I would say the majority of incidences start off as very minor incidental things. Me and my friend went to the um, servery and we were the last at the servery and Rocky Biscuits, you know, the Rocky Chocolate Biscuits, everyone else, no. else had got one. But there was none left for us when we got there. We nearly, nearly went into a riot over a chocolate Rocky Biscuit. Things that are nothing to me and you at the time, like the huge in prison. And little things become massive things and people are willing to kill you over just the slightest of stuff. And, and you become like that too. The first evening I got into that prison, I had my face punched in. I went to get my food. And this guy that I didn't know said hello to me. He said hello, that was all he said. And I said hello back and the guy just walked up and smashed me in the face and told me that this guy was in for some sexual crime or something and if I talk to him again, next time I'm gonna get stabbed. Violence, it was always there. I think the theory must be that if you're gonna put really violent men together, there is a danger that they will become even more violent. In other words, pouring petrol on the flames. Facts. Of their inherent violence. Facts. With dangerous men and makeshift weapons, full Sutton can be a ticking time bomb, and there's only so long the staff can keep control. It is inevitable that things will slip through the net in a place like Full Sutton. No matter where you work in a prison, you are outnumbered. Some of them just enjoy violence, and if they want to take the wing over or create problems, there is not a lot you can do, quite frankly. And it was even worse when this prison was first opened. When you walk into a new prison, it's chaotic. It ain't got a clue. Staff don't know each other. The staff don't know the prisoners. The prisoners don't know the staff. The prisoners don't know the other prisoners. Problems have arisen for very obvious reasons. Three years after Full Sutton opened, these issues became too big for the prison to handle. Whether it was by design or default, we ended up with a lot of fairly new officers in particular who were basically fresh off the street working with these very difficult types of offenders. For some reason, we had a, a bad mix of prisoners as well on some of the wings. They tried to intimidate staff successfully on many occasions. And a lot of the managers left the uniformed officers just to get on with it. And um, quite frankly, we, we lost the prison. Good luck. On the weeds, we went around to do what we wanted to do. People 
drinking, taking drugs. It was just mental. Losing control would make prison officers' jobs at Full Sutton even more challenging. In effect, prisoners are kind of doing what they want. Searches aren't done properly. It sounds like you just gotta hope. You know, of course y'all outnumbered, but you gotta just hope that prisoners will stay in line, look forward to their release date, and try to not get in trouble. You know what I'm saying? Because the only thing keeping prisoners in check is I don't want more time at the end of the day, right? I just don't want no more time added to my sentence. So let me walk a straight and narrow path and only defend myself when I have to. That's what the, that's what the, that's sort of sound like these a lot of these prison guards be banking on at these uh, cat A's. But sometimes, man, they don't care. Me and Gustafa being intimidated, seawing as it was then, full of lifers, eventually got burnt oh, yeah. down. Seawing, they don't we care. ended up one for about a week. Our prison officers were behind shields. You know, you didn't want to go to work in the morning. In the early 1990s, prison officer Paul found himself fully exposed in the struggle in prison. You have like a TV room. These two guys stayed in there, said they weren't coming out. So I went in there to try and reason with them. The next thing I know was they'd slammed the door behind me. They got the big uh, table legs, smashed them up and threatened me, you know, my school was gonna be next. I was trying to be confident, trying to be relaxed. But inside, the stomach was churning, my knees were, were rocking a bit. And, um, it was not a nice feeling at all. And I genuinely feared for my life. I didn't think I was coming out of it. Yeah, I bet you did. That's a creepy, that's a crazy situation. It can be very intimidating. A lot of the prisoners there are very tall, very masculine men. Sometimes they can use that almost against you. You have to just stand your ground and try your hardest to really put on that brave face that none of this is really affecting you. The principal officer, she came down to the wing. I don't know whether it's some gangster rule that you don't hit women or you don't, you know, treat women in that way. But thankfully, she managed to persuade them to come out. Though Paul's ordeal was over, life at Full Sutton was never the same again. I, must have, I, I did lose quite a lot of confidence after that. I still get quite emotional even thinking about it now because it's... Um, you know, it was a very emotional time for me. But staff at full... There's only two ways at the, at the aftermath of that situation could have went. You could have been like like him, very emotional, couldn't cope, couldn't really get back into the swing of things, couldn't, like, you know what I'm saying? Or you can overcompensate, get real mean, real strict, real, you know, which... Which in prison, man, if you're throwing around your... Your weight, they're going to test it eventually, no matter who you are. Sutton would be tested again, this time by a volatile inmate from London convicted of attempted murder. John Onyamichi, he was a man for whom violence was second nature. He was, to some extent, a career criminal. He had track record of violence, use of drugs. He'd been in prison before had scant regard for authority. He has this extraordinary outburst in Ealing where he, a policeman and a community support officer who's patrolling with him had his throat cut. In fact, it was astonishing that he survived. This was brutal, vicious, entirely unwarranted attack. And quite rightly, he was given a very long prison sentence as a result. In 2011, Onyamichi was jailed at the Old Bailey for a minimum of 25 years for the attack. Damn. During his sentence, he would arrive at HMP Full Sutton. I met John on my first day as an officer in Full Sutton. He was just a mountain of a man, absolutely huge. Uh, the way she's describing these dudes, oh, hey. Well, hey, <laughs> you feel me? Extremely intimidating. I met him on a number of occasions. He's a serious man. If you're going to fall out with him, you're going to have to have to end up doing something really serious. Otherwise, he's going to have you. 
He just towered over everybody. He was such a large presence of a man that you couldn't help but look at and wonder what happens if he decides he doesn't want to be around you or, or doesn't want to do what you say. Where, where do you go from there? Hey, yeah. That boy had his intimidation badges equipped and on Hall of Fame. That's what it sounds like. Into his sentence, on Yamichi would be back in court. This time, for an attack that had shocked Full Sutton. He decided that he wanted to take over the wing. He was difficult to restrain by staff, was fighting back, and was out of control. Hull Crown Court was shown footage of the shocking attack at Full Sutton, which took place on August the 9th, 2018. Oh, Onyamichi really goes on this rampage. He hits a prison officer over the head from behind with a heavy pan, steals his keys, starts a fire in the kitchen, piles magazines and shoes and puts a chair and it sets light to that. The attack went on for eight hours, but this footage, lasting 10 minutes, was played in court. What would happen if somebody was sort of kicking off in that manner? Is the wing staff deal with it? With the size of him and his level of... Nah, nah, nah. He had the wing staff on, on, on high alert. He had y'all shivering. Y'all had to out... Y'all had to call somebody. Y'all had to call police interceptors to come get this... Violence. It was extremely... Y'all had to call FBI. Or... Hard for wing staff to even make an attempt. He was using pool cues and pots and pans he could get a hold of to attempt to attack other prisoners and staff. He's really out of control, and the prison officers can't cope. I mean, not surprisingly, he's an incredibly intimidating figure, and he's clearly out of his mind. Presiding, Judge David Tremberg was shown the shocking footage of Onyamichi's rampage. Evidence that it was so out of control, a special team of riot officers needed to be called in. They are the elite officers. They are sent to the most dangerous situations and they're given the most training. This is a particularly extreme example of their use. It took a hundred officers to control, or attempt to control, one man. The footage showed damn- Oh, you mean he had it like that? Oh, man. Image which cost the prison 15,000 pounds. It has to be serious for a hundred officers to go in. It can't be just somebody's throwing a little bit of a tantrum or throwing the dummy out. It has to be a real threat yeah, to nah. life. The CCTV footage showed that with a hundred specially trained officers on the wing, Onyamichi became increasingly frantic. He jumps onto the netting between two parts of that particular wing and runs along it. He's out of control, he's doing whatever he wants, and he's quite prepared to hit anyone with anything. I think at this point he was just having fun. At this point he knew he had got y'all out of y'all element. <laughs> he knew, especially like he was man on deck at that point. Just to get his own way. Finally, he falls through the netting. The prison footage captured this dramatic moment. He fell from the railings and ended up injuring himself. It's like a really solid staircase that he fell down onto and, and just got up and almost continued, which is quite scary. How a man can, you know, survive something like that and, and just get up and continue wanting to fight. Granted, it was not that far of a fall. We, I've seen it. We just all looked at it. If, now, if that staircase went there and he ain't fallen into that staircase and he fell, like, straight onto a pool table, Kind of looked like he broke his ankle, but... I, even then, he, it takes some time to subdue him. It underlines very vividly that a certain units in Full Sun that were simply too dangerous. In the end, we were able to take back E-Wing, uh, but it was a long day. He did uh, manage to cause quite a lot of damage. In court, Onyamichi pled guilty to a variety of offences including ABH, arson, and threats to kill. A further custodial sentence was handed down by the judge. The result of the rampage of Onyamichi was that he got another six years. 
One thing I will never do, man, no matter how angry I get, I've never threatened anybody's life, man. I would never make that threat out of my mouth. Because that'll get you that'll get you time. You say that, you're going to jail. <laughs> Rather you meant it or not. That's where you're headed. You know what I'm saying? So that's one thing I try not to do, man. I don't get angry no more, so it's all good anyway. I try not to. Added to his sentence. One of his explanations in court when he, this was put to him is he said, I was taking steroids and I didn't know the impact they were having on me. Whether that was true or not, it didn't affect the fact that his sentence was extended. The judge stated, you are clearly a powerful man. You went on the rampage and you cared little for your own safety, let alone that of others. With his sentence extended, on your meet you would- That's a crazy headline to read. Let me move this because I am one of the best editors on the platform, so this is- this is light work for me when I do things like boom. You feel me? Nothing. Easy. 20 Stone Prison Rampage Khan is stopped by 100 Riot Gear jailers. It may causes 15,000 pounds of damage and damage as he batters officers and starts fires. Would not be eligible for parole until 2042. It didn't surprise me at all that he would be fighting and it would be a difficult task for them to hold him. Certain men, when they lose it, their only way of expressing how they're feeling would be by way of violence. With Onyemichi convicted for running amok, justice had been served. But for the staff, the most important factor was just getting out alive. There is such a sense of relief among staff because it can escalate so quickly. And we go in there to do a job and to go home to our families. And sometimes you hear of so people not being able to go home to their families. I promise you, you couldn't pay me enough to do this job. I don't care what, I don't care what amount you came with. Yeah, go guard pr category A prisoners. Go do what? I'm so good off that. I did, I don't care the salary. You couldn't. I, mm -mm. No, because I know how it is, man. I, I, I just. Nah. Nah. I know how I am. So I get in there. Aha! You locked up. Ah! No, I'm just playing. I, I wouldn't do that. But I'm just saying, like, I'm pretty sure it's guards that be on that type of time that make it harder for other guards. To work there, it's like, nah, bro, no. <laughs> what just happened? Safe. Oh, okay. It's because of the environment we work in, and that's a risk that you do take when you start working in a maximum security prison. Onyomichi is a, a classic example of the volatility of a high security prison. It only takes one person to lose it, and the whole place is in danger of going up. Onyamichi's rampage was not an isolated incident, as in the years leading up to the attack, assaults on staff in British prisons had nearly tripled. In those environments, prison officers don't feel as though they're safe. You've always got to have that in the back of your mind, but you can't let that affect the job that you do. Next, we move along to Full Sutton's most reviled area, a place known as Beast Wing. The smell is different from normal location. The beastie, beastie, beastie wing. Beast Wing, okay. If you're sent to HMP Full Sutton and find yourself amongst Britain's most reviled offenders, then you have arrived on Beast Wing. Beast Wing is just another name for sex offenders oh, or wow. the degenerates of the criminal world. Sex offenders have to be kept away uh, because they will be uh, harmed 
um, some severely, some to the point where they probably end up dead. Oh, well. If you're a sex offender and you come on normal location, you will get hot water thrown over you, hot fat thrown over you, you will get stabbed to bits. Someone will get rid of you just for the sake of it, whether it matters to them or not. One long-time inmate on this wing was one of Britain's most notorious killers. The Muswell Hill Murderer. Hold on, I ain't never heard of that one. I'm telling you, when I get time to look these up, y'all know where to find them at better than I do, though. What was this? What was this? One long-time inmate on this wing was one of Britain's most notorious killers. The Muswell Hill Murderer. Muswell Hill Murderer. Murderer. Dennis Nielsen is among Britain's most famous serial killers. He would pick up floating young men, whether it's in the pub or in the street, and he would take them home. But then he began to live out the fantasy, his fantasy from childhood, of possessing a passive young man for sex and he would strangle them. He disposed of the bodies in a really horrifying way. He dismembered them and he burnt them on a pyre constructed from tires. He also put some of the flesh down the lavatory. It was this method of Jeffrey Dahmer disposing of his victims that led to his detection. This kind of looked like Jeffrey too, don't it? The moment the police arrive at his door. He's ushered down into the police car to be taken away for interrogation. And the detective says, well, how many people have you killed? And Nielsen says, 15 or 16. At his trial, Nielsen was convicted of murder and sentenced to life imprisonment. Early into that sentence, he arrived at Full Sutton. There's no question that Full Sutton was a logical place to send Dennis Nielsen. He was certainly one of the worst of the worst. He first went to Full Sutton in March 1990, and he was only there for maybe 10 months. He spent the whole time in the segregation unit. It was not the first time Nielsen had been in the segregation Excellent. unit during his time in prison. I was down to six. I don't care what my friend if, hypothetically speaking, I don't care what my friend had been through in their life, their upbringing, I don't care what trauma they've had, if I hear they doing something like this, I'm, no way, <laughs> ain't no way, I'm parting ways, might beat them, <laughs> allegedly, you know what I'm saying, I, I, I could, no, 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 I don't, I, I'm sorry, I don't care. <laughs> This is, I could see, you see how they did this? This down here, friend of Dennis, I would have made them edit it. Ex-friend, I ain't no current, don't say that. Aggregation unit during his time in prison. Don't do me like I was down to segregation and I didn't have no books in a cell. I asked the prison officer, could I get a book to read for tonight? He goes, uh, how about asking your next door neighbor? I said, he's my next door neighbor. And he said to me, Dennis Nelson. I said, oh, ain't that the guy that... And he said to me, yeah, that's the guy. He's been down here yonks. I said, well, ask him for me. Came back about 10 minutes later. I said, yeah, compliments of Dennis. And he gave me the book, and it was called Beyond Belief, which was the first ever book written on Myra Hindley and Ian Brady. Oh, but I heard, we did a documentary on that. I was thinking... Of all books. They wouldn't let me post it on YouTube, so it's on Patreon. Why would you send me that? Nielsen moved around the prison system in the 1990s before returning permanently to Full Sutton in 2001. Dennis Nielsen was a very arrogant person. Kind of saw himself as a bit of an intellectual. He would complain at everything and anything. I think he took me to the civil court twice for various things that he felt he was aggrieved about. Lost both of them. He just felt he was better than everybody else. The only things that ever created altercation with staff were things such as rules and regulations. 
a perceived lack of them being applied equally. But at Full Sutton, Nielsen would have bigger problems than the staff. He didn't have any friends in prison. He obviously had acquaintances and he had neighbours, but not friends in any real sense of the word. No one would talk to him. Yeah, I bet. Imagine I mean, that. Someone who chops up 13 people and shoves them down drain holes, that's like, that's not going to make you friends. That's not how you make friends and influence people in the prison system. A couple of hooded prisoners turned up at his door. He suspected he was going to be beaten up or even murdered. So he picked up a battery that was on the side of his table and he threw it at them just as they were tipping over a pan of boiling sugar water. If you're in a top security prison, you can't settle. Watch your back, because it's full of dangerous people. On another occasion, he was in the TV room. The alarm bell went because somebody had lit a fire on his bed. Despite his notoriety, not every prisoner wanted to attack Nielsen. The staff asked me if I would go and play music with him because he had a keyboard. But no, we just played chess or fucking Scrabble. Dennis Nielsen, the Scrabble cheat. I mean, nicking the Scrabble pieces, always looking in his bag to try and get the blanks. I think he saw himself as special, that he was the more intelligent of everybody. I'm not even gonna lie, Scrabble seems so simple. Spell words, but the little intricacies of the game, like what other, like blanks, like she was trying to get all the blanks he said, or, you know, he was trying to, the, the person said that Neil was trying to get all the blanks and it was like, for what? Like, see, I don't know like the subtleties of the game. I know spell stuff, get points. I don't even know how the point system, well, I don't know how none of that. Everybody and that's the arrogance of the man, I suppose. He was nothing. He wasn't ugly. He wasn't attractive. He wasn't short and he wasn't tall. He was just so average. He was medium as hell, medium as human. <laughs> Nielsen wasn't the only high-profile resident on the wing, as just a few cells down was the man suspected of one of Britain's most evil unsolved crimes, the Babes in the Wood murders. Russell Bishop was a neighbour four doors down. Russell he Bishop. was probably the closest he had to what I would class as a normal friend in prison. Russell Bishop was a disturbed, rather unhappy young man. He had developed quite quickly an appetite for very young girls, and he commits what will be his most famous crime, which was nicknamed Babes in the Wood, in 1986. On this particular October day in 1986, Bishop is watching a group of young girls. The girls are playing outside, and the two of them decide they'll go off, buy a bag of chips. They're called Nicola Fellows and Karen Hadaway. Then they go into Wilds Park. Bishop is all the time tracking them, with only one objective, which is to sexually assault. They go to a little hide in the wood in Wild Park. And in that particular hide, unfortunately, Russell Bishop killed them. Bishop quickly became the prime suspect, and after being arrested, went on trial for the murders. To the astonishment of the prosecution and the police, Bishop is found not guilty. He truly is an evil man, and he got away with it. Despite getting away with murder, Bishop's reign of terror continued. In February 1990, he attacks another young girl, this time age seven. Inevitably, Bishop is convicted and sent to jail. Bishop entered Full Sutton where he would meet Dennis Nielsen. Bishop lent Des his typewriter when the edge fell off Des's old typewriter over Christmas and he needed to carry on with his writings and his correspondence. So for a period, the two of them became intertwined, really. When I read about his crimes, I expected to see this some crazy monster with really crazy manic eyes and it was just average. Just average, there's nothing special, nothing unique, nothing remarkable. This look like a, it look like a, this is like a typical build. 
Oh. Him and Nielsen, whatever his name is. The only interesting thing that a lot of these serial killers have going for them is their crime, because outside of that, they're pretty much nobodies. But long into his prison sentence, the weight of his crimes became too much. Russell Bishop confessed, effectively, to a fellow inmate at Full Sun that he was guilty of killing Nicola and Karen, the Babes in the Wood murders. And in 2018, some considerable time after the original deaths of Nicola and Karen in 1986, he's tried for the Babes in the Wood murder and is, quite rightly, convicted. But in the end, Bishop wouldn't serve much of that sentence. There was a little justice somewhere at the end. Somebody. Because Bishop died in 2022 of terminal cancer. Oh, he just died last year. So after so long in prison, what made Bishop finally confess? I think it was bragging, not remorse, that made him tell a fellow prisoner. I think Bishop didn't suffer any guilt. I think he was just rather proud of it and proud that he got away with it for so long. Bishop's death closed a dark chapter in British criminal history and he proved to be one of the very few acquaintances that Dennis Nielsen ever had in full Sutton. Dennis Nielsen was, as I remember, uh, just an old shell of a man, to be honest. He was quiet, he kept to himself, he'd sit in his room in his little white underwear and read his book and write his poems. In his final years, he was slowing down. He was tiring of most things and his health was slowly fading. I'd definitely say he had a very sad existence in his final years. He was very isolated from what I saw. It usually happens with older prisoners. If they're reasonably infamous as well, they tend to isolate themselves even further because their crime becomes very well known. People on the wing know who they are and what they've done. On the 10th of May, 2018, Dennis Nielsen was transferred to York Hospital, citing stomach pains. He would die there two days later at the age of 72. It does just become part of life. Hey. Good to hear both of them is, you know what I'm saying, out of here. Because people like that, man, they should, they should, if they was in Texas, mm, if they was in Texas, Florida, well, they would have got chemically castrated or something. I don't know what, something would have happened that was negative. In there that people come and go and people die and, and people like that die as well. The prison moves on. In there, you are just another number who will come and go. So, who was the real Dennis Nielsen? We give him far too much credit for being what he used to be like and not the sad old man we'll dying no in a prison cell, which is what he was in the end. He wasn't a, a man with horns or a tail or a big black cloak or staring eyes. He was absolutely ordinary chap. Evil does not come printed on your forehead. Often it's extremely banal. They're ordinary men who don't stand out in the crowd. Next, inside Full Sutton's most reviled wing, one of the most notorious revenge attacks in the prison's history. It was a HMP Full Sutton houses some criminals so despised that they are kept apart for their own protection. But even on Beast Wing, there is no love lost for these offenders. Sex offenders, the worstest of the worst. The scourge of the- Really, we, can, we gotta talk about them for 40 minutes? We just talked about these other two, which in realistic, like, just talked about these other two for 20 minutes. Now we're gonna talk about more for 20 minutes? That's the worst part of these type of documentaries for me, man. The earth, the beasts. There are ordinary sex offenders, your rapist, uh, and then there are child sex offenders, and they are the bottom of the bottom. Oh, there is a hierarchy amongst sex offenders. 
For example, people who've committed crimes against women, they'll look down on people who've committed crimes against children. And then people who've maybe committed crimes against one child, you quite often see them looking down on people who've committed crimes against multiple children. I have heard prisoners actually saying, well, I only raped a woman, you raped a child. I guess it's like anything, you know, we as human beings want other people to be worse than us, don't we? One inmate that every prisoner would look down on was the man who would become known as Britain's worst ever paedophile. Richard Huckle. 71 offences? He used to take regular trips to Malaysia to effectively abuse children, but always presented himself as a sort of English teacher and philanthropist. He was a member of a dark web group called The Love Zone. He was writing a manual for paedophiles on how to make it happen, how to make it work. He bragged that young people in developing countries were much easier to seduce than middle-class people in England. But after a multinational investigation, Huckle's crimes came to light. Huckle, quite rightly, was eventually a court, indeed arrested by the National Crime Agency at Gatwick Airport after a tip-off from the Australians. He was eventually charged with 91 offences and pleaded guilty to 71. His victims ranged from six months to 12 years. In June 2016, Huckle was sentenced for his crimes. Wait. His victims ranged from... Dean Huckle... Okay. Yeah, that was the age. Six months to 12 years is crazy. Huckle was sentenced for his crimes. Richard Huckle was convicted of uh, being a predatory paedophile and was given a life sentence and sent to full Sutton. Life sentence. As a high-profile sex offender, Huckle would have to be kept on beast wing for his own protection. Honestly, in, in the South Florida, uh, and, uh, anywhere in the South, he would have got the death penalty. For sure. I met Richard Huckle anywhere. when he moved on to our unit. He was a very quiet man which doesn't really surprise me considering how infamous he was and everybody knew what he'd done. His crimes were especially heinous, even amongst other sex offenders. He was not popular with anybody, prisoners or staff. With his crimes so well documented, surely this criminal would want to keep a low profile. He was not shy about his crimes. He was almost proud of it. And I think that rubbed a lot of people the wrong way. I really disliked Richard Huckle. I thought he was evil for what he'd done. As in the Britain's worst pitiful has been stabbed to death. <laughs> Glad to hear it. I don't condone violence, but hey. Notorious offender, this inmate would have had a target on his back. Huckle, you've got to expect that. As a sex offender, you're on borrowed time. Definitely. It was no secret amongst a few other prisoners that there was an attempt to be made on his life. The inmate who decided to take revenge on the wing's most reviled man was convicted rapist Paul Fitzgerald. I wanted to say free him so bad, but he had convicted one himself. So, I mean, I, I mean, hey. <laughs> Live by it, die by it. 18th of October 2019, Fitzgerald entered Huckle's cell and effectively kept him hostage for, well, an hour and 18 minutes without anyone noticing. The difference in a top security prison is how far it goes. In a normal prison, if someone's running in your cell, they're running in your cell to just have a fight. In a top security prison, People are running in your cell to try and stab you up and kill you. During that time, he subjected Huckle to the most extraordinary torture and beating. He tied him up, tied his feet, tied his hands, gagged him, raped him, stuffed a blade on a piece of wood up his nose so that it reached his brain, stuck a spoon into his anus. 
Hey, hey, hey. That boy got everything he deserved, didn't he? Didn't he? It's almost unbelievable. Shocking. From my understanding, there was a few other people who were but aware hey. of what was going on and so could keep watch, could tell other people not to press the bells. And so until somebody quite literally stumbled across what was going on, an alarm bell wouldn't be rung. If anybody wanted to assault anybody or do anything of that nature, it was quite easy to do. You could have been in there beaten half to death if that was somebody's wish. A bell went off in a prison when an alarm bell goes. Any free staff, regardless of where they work, are expected to attempt to attend the alarm. Prison officers, sometimes I think they'll wait until there's backup. And then when all the other officers come, then they'll run to the incident and then they'll deal with it. It depends on the inmate, who the person is, and how many dangerous people are on that wing. It just all depends on the situation. We arrived at the wing. Almost immediately, we were sent back. Um, and it wasn't until that evening that we were told um, that he'd been killed in his cell. As a sex offender, you will definitely, definitely get your comeuppance. 100%. No surprises there that he got it. Fitzgerald claimed that it was a good thing, that he was doing the right thing, and he wanted to give Huckle a taste of his own medicine, see how they suffered, you're going to suffer too. When he was found straddling Huckle's body with a pool of blood around Huckle's head, he claimed that he wanted to cook and eat parts of Richard Huckle. I suspect wow, that it had nothing to do with making him feel how others felt. I suspect he was a good old-fashioned monstrous attack. And perhaps he wanted to become famous for the man who killed Britain's worst pedophile. With Huckle dead, questions were asked as to how an attack could last 78 minutes in such a high secure environment. Boy, the security guards knew what was happening. They was, hey, shoot. I'm gonna look the other way. I ain't gonna, that's, they knew. Full Sutton is asked to cope with some of the most dangerous men in the country, and it must be safe and secure. There has to be a suspicion that someone knew something about what was gonna happen to Richard Huckle. It's a bleak thought, but it's, it's very difficult thought. to avoid that conclusion. But despite committing horrendous crimes, did Huckle deserve better protection? There's no question that even a wicked, evil man like Richard Huckle deserved protection. Safety is one of the principles that every prison should work by. And the fact that it, he was killed by a fellow sex offender is a terrible commentary on the safety of prisoners. Lessons would have to be learnt at Full Sutton. The safe sex offender. Whatever he's saying, he capping. He capping. He, he just want to sound good. It sound good. That's what you're supposed to say. I know in his mind he's thinking like the complete opposite of what he's saying. Murder of Richard Huckle. But not every sex offender here would meet the same end. As child molester turned killer, Mikhail Galatinov would discover. Mikhail Galatnikov was a convicted sex offender who was also convicted of a killing in 1997 of a man called Adrian Kaminsky. He was a predatory, and that's why Galatnikov was in full sun. On the same wing as Galatinov was homophobic murderer Mark Goodwin. Mark Goodwin was convicted in 2007 of killing a gay man in Blackpool. There can be no doubt that it was a homophobic attack. And for that, Mark Goodwin found himself in Full Sutton, where he met Mikhail Galatnikov. Mark Goodwin was reasonably quiet, similar to Mikhail, both reasonably friendly. He would sort of keep to himself, didn't really speak to me that much. But from what I kind of saw of him, he was always 
reasonably friendly, chatty, good spirits, considering the circumstances of, of where we were. But soon these wingmates would become more than just friends. The pair met in the prison library at Full Sun, and after a time, it turned into a full-blown sexual relationship. In Full Sutton and every prison, sexual relations are... Wait, I thought he was a homophobe killer. That's what they said, didn't they? Prohibited. However, they'd meet up in each other's pads to engage in sex, and then eventually that sort of turned into a steady relationship. Unlikely though it may sound, you have the homophobe Goodwin, who seems to have fallen in love with a man who's clearly gay and had killed a gay lover. It's almost unbelievable. They were always reasonably affectionate to some level, like they'd give each other a hug and a kiss. They'd always have a little flirt with each other. But Galatinov and Goodwin decided that they wanted to take their relationship to the next level. They what do you mean by that? They decided that they would marry. It was the first time there'd ever been a gay marriage in a British prison. It took place in the children's play area. Yo, how, why would y'all do that? Why would y'all let that happen? Why would they let this happen in this area? Okay, it's fine that y'all let that happen, but why this area specifically would y'all even? Of the visitor center. There were two uh, lady vicars, four prison officers for security, and six prison officers invited by the pair. They said to each other, we're soulmates and we'll be together forever. And they shared a kiss and a piece of cake. But for these newlyweds, married life would be somewhat long distance, even in a maximum security jail. After the marriage, uh, the pair were separated to separate wings of full sun, and they can only meet once a month in visitation, which you would have thought was slightly odd. It is a strange love story as two people have fallen for each other in a very hostile and strange environment. As a love story goes, it is very- Come on, man. We're not gonna make this out to be Romeo and Juliet. Come on now. Be unique and different. I don't think there's one like it, to be honest. I'd almost challenge someone to find two people like them You're who found- you. Nobody would have challenged that. <laughs> we do not care. <laughs> each other in such a strange situation and then decided that they wanted to be married. If everyone in prison who were gay would come out of their closets, I think prison would be transformed overnight. I think it would be a lot cleaner. I think people would be a lot funnier and a lot more charming. As some have suggested... They do get out to the community. They clean and it's a, a, a funny, very funny people. That there could be a more cynical reason for this marriage. The sister of Mark Goodwin's victim has suggested the reason for the marriage was that Glatnikov realised he was due for parole in not too distant future and that this was a way of making him seem respectable and upright and a changed man. I suppose none of us will probably ever really know why they really decided to get married and separate rather than stay together on a wing, I, I couldn't tell you and I don't. So, somebody thought they developed that whole plan because parole was coming and they wanted to get out. So you telling me they was in there, meet the chicken, because parole was getting close. I don't think anybody apart from Mark and Mikhail could tell you why they made that choice. I think it's a fascinating question about whether Goodwin came out because he realised he was gay, really, underneath all the homophobia, or whether he was seduced. I mean, there's no question that Galatnikov was charismatic, and it's possible that this was a way for Goodwin to make his life in Full Sun a little e easier. I think dude was truly, really, 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 really... He was really one of the members under that... Um, under all that phobia. That's how I'd be, low-key. It's hard to be, be absolutely sure what was going on there. 
with it's the killers. It's not just desperate desire for a lustful relationship. So I think it was a more complex relationship than that. Next, more inmates of full jump off in next door neighbor. HMP Full Sutton is a prison for some of the worst category A criminals in Britain. But some of the inmates in here like to be more than just friends. Sex has been going on in prisons for as long as any of us can even begin to remember. Gay for the stay. It is what it says on the tin. There is inevitably going to be an outlet for sexual desires which have to be of the same sex. Sometimes it's just like, you just want to get your freak on by the bins on the exercise yard. You just want to get each other off. I mean, what else is there to do in prison? But not all relationships in prison are out in the open. Men do not like to talk about having sex with other men. It's still a taboo. Men are brought up to be ashamed to have even feelings of sex with other men. I'll have one person and it'll call me a and call me a and the next minute I'll look through his spy hole, someone's giving a blowjob in the fucking cell. They won't come to you until they're really stoned or really drunk and then they just want to use you and chuck you away like an old tissue. They come in to say they care about you. Yeah, they care about you when they're having sex, but like, as soon as that's done, they, they, they're just off ski. Very, very well hidden. But a lot of us have secret lives, and many people do, so they might not be too happy to admit it. They'd be so ashamed that anybody else would find out. They completely blank me, even though we've been having sex together almost like for two years. But outside the cell, they, they would not even acknowledge my existence because they'd be so embarrassed. But this prisoner was numb to rejection from fellow inmates after a difficult childhood. I didn't have much of a foundation to build on, just, just a childhood of, full of abuse. Compassion meant nothing in my family. Oh, this is... My father wanted his children to be like him, bigots, racist, mean-spirited people. There were so many opportunities where the system could have helped me, where I asked for help, and they just said, look, we, there's nothing we can do for you. You just gotta make it on your own. All I knew was that my life was bad, and it was just gonna get badder. Sarah Worse. drifted into a life of crime, graduating from car theft to kidnap and torture. After the attempted murder of a fellow inmate at a previous prison, she arrived at Full Sutton in the early 90s. When I arrived in Full Sutton, as a lot of people do, it was my first maximum security prison. What took my breath away was how feral everyone seemed to be. Just roughing it out, scrapping it out, fighting over bits of drugs, fighting over bits of meat that had been stolen, do you know what I mean, from a kitchen. It was insane. Day-to-day -day life in Full Sutton would be difficult enough, but Sarah also had a secret. I always had this belief since I was a child that I was a woman trapped in a man's body. I'd never heard of transsexuality or transgender. I didn't know about none of these things. If I said to my father that I, I didn't think that I was a boy and that I was a girl, my father would have just beaten me even more than he did already. So it's pretty much something that I sat on, really. It wasn't something that I felt I needed to talk about and I didn't really have the vocabulary to explain how I was feeling. In full sudden, I realised that there were certain skills that I had. I was able to use them skills so that I would be protected. I was a streetwise kid. I used to be a rent boy. So sex for money was no big deal to me. Giving someone like a blowjob for a tenner's worth of phone cards. A load of people paid me for sex. I was young and I was really cool, I reckon and I was really pretty. But using your body in prison as a commodity is not always enough to keep you safe. In prison, no, no doesn't mean no. In jail, no one's gonna listen to you. No one's gonna come when you scream. They're not. They'll just say you brought it on yourself. You can find no compassion in there. It is an act of inconceivable cruelty and a, a depravity that it's almost hard to imagine. 
Sarah continued to live as a man during her time in the prison system, but after 20 years inside, Dang. she finally had hope she could become the person she really was. In prison, you couldn't come out as trans until 2011. First of all, you'd have to put an application into the governor and you say, this is my, my pronoun, she, her. Then hopefully within the next month, the governor will go, okay then, I am going to let you go on this journey that you're on, this pathway that you're on. They'll give me an identification card and of Sarah Jane Baker instead of Alan Baker. And of course, as soon as it came out, it meant that I was allowed the female clothing that I normally wear every day. She used to walk around the wing in her women's clothing. Strangely enough, most of the other prisoners let them get on with it. Coming out as trans, if there was anywhere to do it, it was prison because it toughened me up. And obviously, for the fact that I was in prison, there was lots of parts of my personality that needed lots of work. Obviously, I didn't realise how much it would really make people angry, especially like some of the visitors who would come to visit their dads and their uncles and their brothers. They never contemplated that there could be transgender people because I used to pass really well. And the better you pass, the mums and the wives of other prisoners, man, they'll hate you. Yeah, it's just jealousy. But even with her gender identity changed, completing her transition in prison would not be possible. Because I was a prisoner, they would not give me any treatment, they would not prescribe me any kind of hormones. I thought that even though I was in prison, I would be entitled to the same treatment and the same level of compassion from the NHS. I mean, but not for prisoners. Prison is not a place of humanity. Hope, compassion, all those words, they're words you hear very rarely in, in the prison system. Shit schooling, shit home life, shit prison. And then you get out of prison, you've got to start it all again. Next, after serving long sentences, how do inmates leaving full Sutton adapt to the outside world? I used to be scared to get out sometimes. The whole 40 minutes of this show was Crazy. I had a, a serious capacity to self-destruct. Then I got put under surveillance. Your name's never going to be the same again. Since it first opened, Full Sutton has been a jail with a troubled history. But with lessons learned from the past, does this prison have a promising future? Today, I believe it's a lot better. Over the years, Full Sutton has kind of changed since the introduction of uh, probably better, better managed prison officers and the introduction of schemes to try and deal with some of the underlying problems of particularly uh, dangerous prisoners, uh, things seem to have calmed down. The most recent yeah, inspection report calls it safe, remarkably safe, uh, and well-run high security prison. So yes, it has a checkered past but it has seemed to have got back onto its feet and is doing what it was being asked to do. And if you're an inmate here, it's likely that you'll be serving a long sentence. But once you've done your time, adjusting to the outside world can prove to be a whole new challenge. When I finally got released from prison. A lot of re-offenders in the UK. Across the world, probably, there's a lot of offenders. I was released as a Category A prisoner. So I had our station dog escort me to the gate and put handcuffs on me in the gate. And then I had police take me to the hospital. And then I got took her out of handcuffs. I was on surveillance for six months, covert surveillance. And these are all stuff where I had to navigate to make sure I didn't go back to prison. I was so institutionalized that I'd, I used to be scared to get out sometimes, and when I got out, I couldn't last because I couldn't cope with the outside world. One of my biggest struggles is socialising. When I'm around groups of people, I just turn into a different person sometimes because I just don't know how to cope with their emotional experiences. The night before I used to go home, I used to lie in my bed and think, if you can do this, if you don't rob, you don't burgle, you don't steal, but I had a, a, lot of a serious capacity to self-destruct. 
and ruin any chances of anything good for myself. I thought I'd come out and half start off where I left off and it, that's not going to work. I realised I couldn't be what I used to be and life's moved on and all that's past, you know. Facts. Facts. Going to jail and coming out, even for one year, going to jail for one year and coming out and thinking that it, stuff is going to be the same, it's not. Maybe, okay, let, one year is extreme. Like, one year, maybe it'll still be the same. But, like, two, three years? Like, at that point, like, you a whole different person. You might not be a whole different person, but the world you left behind is a whole different world. You know what I'm saying? Some of these people went out, went to jail when Razor phones was it. Blackberries was it. And they came out to iPhones. Like, they ain't even the same trap no more. You can't even trap the same no more. Like, it's, you know. But the old habits you've learned from prison life can be hard to lose. Prison makes you hyper-vigilant. It makes you see people in their worst light because you're looking for threats. Sound like Chicago. I've been quite lucky. Since I got out of jail, I get lots of help. I mean, my parole officer and that, they give me lots of help. I have a psychiatrist and a psychologist who really work harder to try and pick that 30 years in prison. What did they think I was going to be like when I got out? You know? I mean, full set of maximum security, done my brain in. How you can ever be well after such a long experience of experiencing those kind of feelings day in and day out for years and years and years is beyond me. Because I even go places outside here now and I'm tense and I'm thinking there's no reason to be tense. But you live in that way for so long, it becomes second nature. You need good people around you when you come out of prison in this country. Yeah, that's a fact. Good people around you, period, in life will elevate you to somewhere else, somewhere better. They just lock you up and then let you out with the threat of locking you up again. And that's it. <laughs> Nothing's done. Nothing's changed. And as a former inmate, you may not be the only one struggling with life outside the prison walls. Myself and a lot of prison staff struggled. Hey, quit. Just quit then. I don't even want to hear it from y'all. I'm going to be honest, man. Hey, listen, I know y'all be going through it in there as guards, but hey, just quit. I don't be wanting to hear this. And still struggle no in the outside world. You notice yourself getting nervous in crowded spaces, checking over your shoulder. A lot of staff in there changed the way they parent because of who they worked with and, and what happened. People who don't work in prisons, who don't see prisoners, who don't see the levels of violence that these people can commit day to day, don't fully understand the sort of things you deal with. Full Sutton has had a lasting impact on those who lived and worked inside its high walls. But did this prison change inmates for the better? The judge who sentenced me, he told me prison was going to change my life and make me a better person. No, it didn't at all. There was no one in Full Sutton or maximum security to say, you know what, you can be better than this. I saw people who were damaged, people who were brutalised, people who were traumatised by their past, and all they could do was continue that, that spiral. Each time I came out with no plan, I continued and continued in the same way for all those years and years and years. It just feels like a complete waste of life. I think it's important that we start looking at how we can actually change the people help them a little bit more because they will be getting out and they will be amongst us. If you get the right role models in prison, you know you, get to know you, and know where your thinking is wrong and can guide you step by step, bit by bit, spotting talents, abilities in you that all of us have as individuals and get you into that. Teach yourself something new, education, reading, life skills, do whatever you've got to do that, that's going to make sure that you're not going to go back to your old ways when you get out. But all of them. It's probably easier said than done when you looking back and reflecting. 
A lot of people don't see that end. A lot of people don't see the light. Ultimately, jail became my home. It's part and parcel of the game. It's not, a lot of people don't see the light, and a lot of prisons don't have people employed to help prisoners see the light. That I chose, and the lifestyle that I chose to live. I understand the need to put people in jails, like Full Sutton. People want to feel that they get in their justice. But if people demand that people are sent to prison just for the fact of revenge, this spiral, this circle, nothing about? stops that. Close. What did I learn from Full Sutton? I learned how to survive. Two independent investigations found no concerns about staff at the time of Richard Huckle's death. A recent independent report highlighted satisfactory resettlement work for those released directly from Full Sutton. A prison service spokesperson said, The claims made are unfounded. A recent independent report highlighted good relationships between staff and prisoners. Cap. TLO, leave a like, comment, surprise. <laughs> leave a like, comment. TLO, leave a like, comment. I'm drawing a blank. Oh, leave a like, comment, subscribe, turn on your post notification bells. I'm going to edit that out. I'm going to go.